And hello, one and all. Welcome back to the Behind the Mic podcast. I'm Matthew Owens. Thank you so much for clicking on once again for episode two of the Behind the Mic podcast. So great to have you with us again. And so great to have John Forsland, the great John Forsland. You'll hear my conversation with the voice of the Seattle Kraken in just a moment. But first, if you did miss episode one, be sure to check it out here on the channel with ESPN and the SEC Network's Tom Hart. Tom was great to talk to. Hope you enjoy that episode. And uh, episode two here with John Forsland, uh, in my opinion, the best voice in hockey as of now, certainly uh, Doc Emmerich in most people's mind held that throne for years upon years. With his retirement, there is a question in the sports media world on who has taken over the throne as the best voice in hockey. Certainly Sean McDonough is up there, the lead voice for ESPN and ABC's coverage coming off of calling the Stanley Cup final. Kenny Albert is the lead voice at Turner Sports and TNT. He and they will have the Stanley Cup final next season, uh, and he's been on hockey for forever. Uh, but there's also some really good voices out there on the game. Uh, you think of Brendan Burke, voice of the Islanders. He's on TNT as well. Bob Washusen has really emerged as a spectacular hockey play-by-play guy. But John Forsland has been at this for a long time. Of course, living in North Carolina, I heard him night in and night out on the Carolina Hurricane broadcast uh, for many years. Now, of course, the folks of Seattle are getting to hear him night in and night out with the Kraken heading into their second season of existence this upcoming season. We talked about the Kraken a little bit in this conversation and of just about how John rose up the ladder and became this great hockey voice his time with the hurricanes before that his time with the hartford whalers a lot of national work he's done for a long time with nbc and versus and nbcsn uh he was with turner for a few regular season games and stanley cup playoff games this past season we talk about all of that and a little bit more certainly hope that you enjoy the conversation and john has been so good to a lot of folks, including myself, uh, you know, and, and something that was in the conversation that we had with Tom Hart last week about him interacting with fans on Twitter. Of course, social media and Twitter is so unique and it, it definitely has a dark side, as we know, especially with sports fans that they get angry when their team loses and they immediately want to bark at the announcer <laughs> that called the game Now. Tom talked about that on the previous episode. These announcers don't have to respond to anyone on Twitter. They don't even have to have a Twitter account um, if they didn't want to save themselves that kind of stress. But John Forsland is a guy that has always uh, responded to people on Twitter. Uh, he's always been very cordial and very nice with people on Twitter. He's been great to me. Uh, I had him on a show that I once co-hosted a morning sports talk show a couple of years ago. He was, he, he was very gracious. He was very uh, ready, jumped on the occasion of joining that show. A and he's been very nice and very great to me interacting on Twitter. Can't thank him enough for joining for this show. And I hope you enjoy my conversation with John Forsland, the second guest on the behind the mic podcast. Enjoy. And joining me now on the Behind the Mic podcast is one of the best hockey announcers in my mind, the best hockey announcer in the game right now, former voice, of course, of the Hartford Whalers, Carolina Hurricanes, and now the voice of the Seattle Kraken, John Forsland, joining us today. Thank you so much for joining me, John. How are you today? I'm good, Matthew. It's my pleasure. I appreciate it. What you just said, I hope I, I, you said it perfectly, exactly how I, as I wrote it. But anyway, that's uh, <laughs> that's OK. I hope you're well and I look forward to our visit here. It should be a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I'm excited. And, you know, this is, this is a brand new bro uh, podcast. You're our uh, second guest. So thanks for joining Great. us. And uh, I, I love talking about hockey. I love hockey. I love watching hockey. And mm -hmm. I love listening to hockey announcers. Uh, I've said for years upon years. Uh, in this business, in this industry, the people I respect the most, I think, are people that can do play-by-play -play on hockey, 
as well as people like yourself do. How, how challenging is hockey? Because I think a lot of people like me, we watch hockey, we listen to the announcers. You guys make it seem so simple, but it's just not. It, it really isn't. I mean, there's a lot of things that, that go into this. The, the nature of the game, the, the speed of the game, that's pretty obvious. The free substitution, I think, is a challenge because you don't see that in any sport where within the flow of the game, the players are changing and there's new players out there and, you know, you can't rely on a set lineup all the time. There isn't a lot of time to weave in stories. The game is very fast and stops and starts. And you have to be sure that you're, you have good timing when you interject some stories or some factual knowledge, some statistic that might be really cool for the the audience to listen to. Um, So all those things factor in, but at the end of it all, the game takes over the beauty of the game, the speed of the game. Obviously it's a, a labor of love for me, my entire professional career, except for a few other gigs here and there have been, you know, Um, dedicated to the sport of hockey. But this started for me at a very young age. My love for the game started when I was nine or 10 years old. And really, it wasn't just my love for the sport. It was my love for the cadence of the call of the game. And I fell in love with that, started a hobby. And that hobby and that dream led me down a path where I was able to strike it professionally. I'm very lucky. Yeah, absolutely. And So I want to talk real quick about the preparation for it, because like you said, Mm -hmm. there's you don't get in basketball starting five and then you get a timeout and, you know, three substitutions come in. You don't get that. Let's face it. You can get some names that are this long, (laughs) very difficult to say very quickly. So I want to hear what preparation uh, before a hockey broadcast is like for you. Mine is uh, pretty exhausting. I think it is for most. I think you put a lot of time into whatever it is. It could be a a high school football game. I think you would prepare. I, I know I would. I would prepare the same way in terms of the amount of hours needed. But it where it's different in hockey for me is not only is there book knowledge of the game and your your form, your set routine that you utilize to prepare for every game, but it's the amount of hockey that I watch. I consume a great deal of hockey on a daily basis during the season. As a matter of fact, I I'm a big sports fan. I love all sports, but once we hit training camp and get into the crux of a season, for instance, I don't watch a lot of NFL football. My Sundays are dedicated either working or preparing to work, which means I'm watching two or three games per day on off days as much as possible. And I have a set form in terms of who I'm covering next, about three games in advance. That leads me down this path to the night before and the day of and the hours that you put in for that show, for that game. So that's how I do it. You might say, well, why do you watch so much? Well, you watch, obviously, to stay up with the the news of the game. But I watch for visual reasons. I call the game in my head as I'm watching because, as you know, in hockey, Uh, The numbers aren't always easy to discern Um, skating styles, who's playing with who uh, those types of things really factor in, in the heat of the game in the heat of the broadcast, because of the things we talked about at the top, the speed of the game and so on. You need to have that visual awareness of what a guy looks like without relying on shoulder patches for numerals or the back of the Jersey. And you're too far away to see the names. The names are, are not even, uh, a, a concern. You can't even, you can't even utilize that. So anyway, that that's what I do. Um, and if you're asking how many hours for per game, I would say about four hours uh, night before day of maybe five hours leading into the game. I like to have everything done by mid afternoon so that I'm, I'm finished. Some people um, do their prep work when they get to the press box, they like to do it. So it's fresh. I like, I do it differently. I I do it all ahead of time so that when I get to the press box, I'm relaxing basically. Yeah. Well, I I would just imagine if you're doing a playoff series or in your case, doing hurricane or Kraken games over and over, obviously you're going to know 20 Sebastian Ajo, 37 Andrei Svechnikov. You're going to know that, but I mean, you, you get these teams that pop up you know, one night you're playing the Winnipeg Jets and then the next night you're playing Ottawa and then the following night you're playing Boston. That's a lot of information. That's a lot of different numbers and players that's coming at you in a very, I mean, hockey, the hockey season goes quick, as you know, it's, 
it's a game on Monday. It's a game on Wednesday. It's a game, maybe a back to back. Yeah. And there's no off season anymore. Um, there used to be, there used to be a, an opportunity to kind of put it away. There wasn't a lot of news in the summer months, but now with the draft and free agency and the salary cap, you really have to pay attention in the month of July because by the, in this case, free agency is July 13th this season. It's usually July 1st, but in years past after July 1st, and maybe through the 4th of July, 5th of July, the teams are set. And so you then get your time to take a little bit of a break and step away from the actual preparation of what you're doing for your job. But I never let it go. I, I am always aware of what's happening, and I have um, notes and files on all teams. Um, as you know, I do, I do a lot of national work and, and have done a lot of that in the past. That kind of kept me in tune with all the teams. So yes, I'm the voice of the Kraken, but I'm pretty well versed on the 31 yeah. so that I'm, I could do a game in September cold. If I had to, I don't like to play catch up. I don't like to get to December. And because I haven't seen the Florida Panthers yet, I'm trying to catch up a week before on what they're all about. I never let it go over the course of the summer through training camp. It's a lot of work, but I, I pride myself in it. I think that's what you have to do. So it's easier to prepare because I already know who's on the fourth line, who's on the third defense pair, not just the stars of each team. That's how deep the knowledge has to be, in my opinion, to do the job correctly. You mentioned you do national work. You spent a lot of time at NBC and well, it went from versus to NBC sports network and then NBCSN. Now you've done some work this past year with TNT. Uh, have you, did you have much time during the season or into the postseason to watch the ESPN and the TNT broadcast? How are they doing things uh, differently than NBC did these past, however long they were, what, 16 years they did the NHL. Yeah, well, you know, it was it was difficult last summer um, and leading into when when the rights broke down and NBC lost the rights. Um, I had worked a long time for them uh, going back to 2011 when the merger with Versus first took place, um, worked my way up into a slot where I was getting a lot of regular work. And of course, then uh, Mike Emmerich decided, you know, what he was going to do with with his career, you know, in and around the pandemic and the bubble and everything. It kind of, I think, uh, hurried things up for Doc, I think. Uh, who's a dear friend of mine who, um, you know, just had to make some decisions based on his life and where he was at in his career. That was time to step down. Uh, there was a lot of things going on for me at the time, as you know, in the, uh, June of 2020, my, my deal with the hurricanes broke down. Um, I had to move on with a new chapter in my career. So I did, I, I looked at a couple of teams that were had vacancies. The new team was obvious. They shown some interest in me. The Tampa Bay lightning uh, showed a lot of interest in me, um, offered me a job in November of 2020. I turned it down because I, I wanted to um, uh, stay with NBC. Um, the Tampa Bay job, they kind of uh, were a little bit concerned about the amount of national work. And for me, I'd worked a long time to get in that slot, so I didn't want to just relinquish it. And so the 21 season, the 56 game schedule kicked off. And then near the end of that, um, the talks broke down with NBC. ESPN came in with a mega deal. Turner dovetailed that. Um, and then what happened? So I had to make a decision in and around all of that of what to do. Um, I didn't realize how much I missed being with a team until I got back with one. So in and around the holidays, 2021, uh, 20 to 21, over the new year, Seattle offered me the job, opportunity of a lifetime to mark time with a franchise for the second time in my career from the beginning. So I went for it. I had to relinquish some of the national work. So I tried last summer, but there wasn't a lot going on. ESPN had already decided they were going to go with their brand and their people. And Turner had made some decisions based on um, uh, uh, some people they had some familiarity with and so on, and they're good decisions. And so anyway, I just kind of took a step back. But as the season unfolded, I start, my phone started to ring again. Um, I was really happy to do some games in the regular season with Turner. Um, I was really happy to do the playoffs for them. I hope there's more of that on the horizon. I did watch both. At the beginning, it was hard um, because a lot of people immediately said, oh, this is obviously going to be way better than NBC. 
uh, we were very, very proud of what we did there uh, for a long time and carried the torch for the NHL. Um, I will say that I think it's good for the game. I think it's good to have two rights holders kind of making each other better. Um, I think the platforms that ESPN offers are better for hockey. Um, there's more opportunity to be on during the day on Sports Center and The Point on ESPN2 and all these wraparound shows that really SN, NBC, SN could not afford the league. It's unfortunate. Um, but I do think there's some improvements each could make moving forward. I hope to be part of it. We'll just see. But as of right now, I'm, I'm very happy to be doing what I'm doing with the Kraken. And I did a lot of work for national radio in the playoffs, too, for Sports USA, and look forward to working with them again. I, I want to get into the Kraken and the Hurricanes, for that matter, because you mentioned it. But, but I want to, while we're on the national TV talk, I, I want to go back this is always a game that sticks in my mind come playoff time. One of my favorite games just to relive. And you were on it. So I want to take you back to 2011, uh, oh, round boy. one, game seven, Chicago, Vancouver. Yeah. That that wow. game that game lives in my mind for so many reasons. Uh, as you know, Vancouver was eliminated by Chicago in the playoffs each of the two years prior. Then in 2011, they won the President's Trophy. They were easily the best team in the league, and they had a 3-0 lead on Chicago in that series. Blackhawks roared back to force Game Seven in Vancouver. You mm -hmm. were there for versus mm -hmm. uh, Daryl Ray, I believe you were with yeah. in that game, yeah. and. What a great game. To me, it's one of the most underrated games in NHL history. And uh, Vancouver, of course, wins in overtime. They exercise their demons. Uh, yeah. you remember much from that 11 years ago now? I, I do. I remember a lot about it. And, and I appreciate you bringing that up. It's one of my favorite games that I don't think about much, but I am now. Um, I, I'm very proud of the call, uh, the goal, Alex Burroughs, at the end of that game. Um, it was great to be in that city for that. Um, it was a terrific playoff series. And the, the funny thing about it is flying from uh, into Vancouver to do game seven. Now, my memory doesn't serve me right on this. I don't think we did game six. Um, I'd have been another crew on six and we were the crew. Kenny for seven. Albert. Yeah, Kenny Albert right. That crew. Yeah. right. So my flight from Raleigh got all screwed up the day before to get out to Vancouver. And the same thing with Razor. And so, you know, he and I have a great history going back to our first jobs together uh, with Hartford in 1995. Here we are in 2011, ready to do this game. But I bring this up is because this is a mishap of the industry that people don't get to see. You know, all of my preparation the day before was um, for not because I didn't get a chance to do it because of the long delay in flights and getting out to Vancouver. I blew away the whole day. And I remember how tired I was the morning of game seven, but the energy of the job, the energy of the game kind of lifts you through it. And that was a great, that was a great game, a terrific series. Um, you know, it was great to be on a game seven. It was, uh, you know, that was early in the, uh, uh, you know, getting, getting near the merger and all of that. And so uh, to get that assignment was big um, because not everybody just automatically went from versus to the new family of networks with NBC. Um, so anyway, I think it was good for my career. It was a great game. The game carries the broadcast. The game is first. And that one was front and center. And it was a, a terrific victory for the Canucks and just a great overtime winner by Burroughs. Yeah. Uh, Jim Houston had that call who, again, yeah. one of the greats, uh, he had the call in Canada. There's, it's just a, such a great game. Uh, and I, I love to relive it come playoff time each year. Um, I, I do want to get into uh, you were with Hartford, relocated mm -hmm. to Raleigh. Mm -hmm. We've spoken before. Uh, you were on another show that I co-hosted, and we talked about this, about kind of selling hockey to the people mm -hmm. of North Carolina. Uh, any similarities to what you did then with what you did this past year with Seattle? Um, a little bit, but not much. You know, I think coming to Raleigh from Hartford in 97 was virgin territory um, mm -hmm. for the game and for us. Um, going to Seattle at this stage in, in uh, 2021 was way different. You know, the world is different. The ways to promote yourself and the team are different on, on different platforms. Um, so the buildup 
for an expansion team is a, a few years. So by the time you hit the ice, there's this crescendo of interest and there's a huge season ticket base. We started in Raleigh with nothing. Um, I believe the, the relocation from Hartford to North Carolina was the fastest in professional sports. I, I don't know. I had heard that somewhere. It was four and a half months. So the season ended and we had to figure out and our management had to figure out how logistically this was going to work. Never mind coming here and starting a new team and a new franchise, but um, coming in and just figuring out where we we're going to play, how we we're going to get there. Do we live in Greensboro? Do we move our families to Raleigh? What's this commute going to be like? What's the booth going to look like? Who's covering the games? How many games are we going to televise? Do the people that are in and around the game know what they're doing? Um, all of these things were like, wow, this is overload. So Seattle was more turnkey because of the professionals that are out there and the people they had in place. Um, but once the season started and I got into my job, I felt the same. I felt like, okay, and I use the same approach. People would ask me, how are you going to handle this? You know, you're going to educate. I said, of course I'm going to educate. I educate when I do a national game. I think we, you can't take for granted that everybody that's watching is a, a real hard a hockey fan. You know, there's a lot of people that are casually watching. So there's always a level in our game of education. Um, but you, you have to walk a line, you have to educate and you cannot uh, frustrate or ignore the fact there are people that are in tune with it that are watching that you could really anger to the point where they don't want to listen or watch anymore. So I think we did a really good job with that my first year out there with JT Brown. I think we had a remarkable season. I told a lot of people this. Uh, it's one of the best years, if not the best year of my career, only because it, the timing of it and the fact that I feel rejuvenated again. The last couple of years have been tough for me. Um, uh, it's just been a, a difficult breakup with the local team in Carolina. And then, you know, how I was going to get to this place and could I actually pull this off at my age and the stage of my career? So, yeah, I was a little bit anxious about the whole situation when it started. But uh, thank goodness it, it really worked out well. Yeah. I listen to a lot of Kraken games this year with ESPN Plus. Uh, you get to choose the stream, put on Kraken games just to see the atmosphere, see the games, and of course listen to you. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not just saying that. I, I love listening to you, um, but I do want to ask you about JT Brown because um, I did. I listened to a few games early in the season. He, he, he was he was gaining his footing, right? He was easing mm -hmm. into it. And, and mm -hmm. I listened to a few games at the end of the season, and it seemed like in the span of less than a season, he uh, really grew as a broadcaster. How was it working with him? It was great. And he's only going to get better. He, he's a natural at this. I think the hardest thing, and I went through it, and because I went through it as a young broadcaster, I was able to – you know, to parlay this over to him and say, here, here, here's what you got to remember. Cause I made these mistakes. I think we all do. When you're a young broadcaster, you want to do a couple of things. You want to prove to your, your audience, either radio or television, that you are really, really well prepared to do this game. You've got everything locked down. You got all the numbers, you got the angles, you got the storylines and come hell or high water. You're, you're going to, you're going to burp all of this up in the first 10 minutes of the show. We're all guilty of that. You have to figure out timing and where to go and where these things place and understand that the majority of your prep is going to be thrown in the, in the, in the bin mm -hmm. and you're going to use about 5%, but that 5% has to be gold. Mm -hmm. You know, there might be one or two nuggets that really are salient points that make sense. The other thing I told him was be yourself. There are a lot of people coaching him up in the summer, a lot of seminars. They brought in a, a professional broadcast coach to work with them in the summer. When I went out for the expansion draft in July, spent about 10 days there. We had two or three mock broadcasts. I went away in August. He did a couple with Everett Fitzhugh. Um, and then, you know, all these red flags started to go up that, you know, um, is he going to be able to do this? Because, you got to have faith. You know, if you're going to take someone right out of playing and give them this opportunity, let them grow a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I told, I told JT, listen, be yourself. You've got a boatload of experience that no one else has. 
not even me, because I never played the game professionally. So it's way different. Anybody that's been in a locker room, been on the bench in any sport and has been paid to play at the highest level has all kinds of experiences that we don't have and we can't relate to. And what they have to do is take that and make it relatable for the audience. And I said, the only way to do that is to be yourself. And remember, if you try to pattern yourself after somebody else, that person's already done it. And that's my advice for young play-by-play people out there. Listen, if you emulate someone, you know, that's okay. Don't imitate, you know, because if you imitate, then you're trying to be the next one like that. Mm -hmm. And, and you don't want to do that because that person's already carved out identity, pick your own identity, because that's going to be more relatable and it's authentic and you can sell that. So he was able to do that and work really hard. And I think you're right. I think next season, he's even going to go more, you know, through the roof and he's a great person. He loves the game. Uh, He and I are totally different generations, man. I'm 60. He's 32, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so, but we're really good friends. And I I think that's the most important thing. I even told him in the summer, I said, I don't know if you'll like me. I I, I can't force you to like me. I hope you do. Um, Is it important? Yes. Is it essential? No. A lot of broadcasters play by play seat, color seat, don't see eye to eye, but they get on the air and it's gold. Um, but it helps if you do have really good chemistry away from the game and away from the job, it, it really shows and your audience can kind of get that. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, it just felt to me watching hurricane games for all my life, you and trip Tracy just had mm-hmm. so much fun <laughs> every right. single and, night. And, 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 it, and it was the same thing I told trip because trip was in a similar spot. He, he was given a great opportunity at, at, in 1998, but he was given the opportunity. Sometimes that's a curse mm-hmm. because he, he didn't have the to, to really do a lot of work uh, in the minor leagues at this to get there. He came off as a player. He got thrown right into this. They felt he would be good at it. They were right. But he had to figure out how to be himself. So I told him many, many years ago, listen, I'll be me and you be you and we'll be fine. And the same thing when I went to Seattle, they were all concerned about how we were going to dress. And maybe we needed to dress like we're going to be the cool team, right? Well, JT's already cool, right? (laughs) And I'm not. I'm just who I am, right? And I'm comfortable presenting my brand as I am. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm not going to change. So I'll do what I do. He does what he does. Watch what happens. And if I tried to come on the air with an open collar and some some suit that looks like it should be in a 30 year old and I'm 60, that's not going to work. And he's not going to look good in the type of clothes. I, I, I wear nice clothes and they're in style, but he's not going to do the same thing. And that's why I think we were authentic and are. And I think we're going to have a great career together, a long one, I hope. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, too. Now, this is more of a sports media podcast than a sports podcast, but I want to ask you one sports question. Year one in Seattle, on the ice with the players. What? How, how would you grade year one? What's coming in the future for the Kraken? Well, I, it's almost an incomplete. Okay, it, it, it's almost you would grade the play on the ice a, a C minus. Um, you you would grade a lot of things that they did. Um, you know, along the, that same way, you would grade off the ice A++. You would grade facilities, fan base, energy, marketing, branding, A++. All those things are great. Um, the team was the team. And the team, I think, got caught up in the Vegas deal at the beginning yeah. of the year, yeah. chasing that. And that was probably unrealistic, but I think everyone from the fans, management, everybody was thinking, hey, this can happen here too. And if it does, it's going to be unbelievable. And it didn't. And then you had COVID. You had a lot of things that were challenging for all the teams, but for an expansion team with no player pool to pick from when you have COVID, uh, there's only about seven players in the minor leagues under contract. So you don't have a full team somewhere. And so that kind of was an issue for Dave Haxtall. He had to figure that out along the way. I think it was tough for him to coach the team through all of that. And then they had little spurts where it looked good. And then the spurts where it was just terrible. There are a couple of nine game winless stretches that I never saw coming. So I thought they would be a lot closer to the playoff line than they were. So I say it's a disappointment on the ice. I think they have an ability to fix it. 
But I also think that Ron has a plan in place. You know, Ron Francis did a lot of great work with the Hurricanes to build a foundation. Um, they made a change. Um, one could argue for the better or not. It looks like it is for the better, the way the Hurricanes have taken off since. But I think what Ron did is draft and develop and go to that first so that the foundation of the house is built. And I don't think he's gonna waver from that. I think there's pressure to kind of knee jerk a few things. I really think he wants to get a, a boatload of draft choices in play here and kind of build it that way. And we have to continue to message our fans so that they understand the process of what the team's going through, not the one and done type thing and then chase your tail. Like I think the Vegas Golden Knights have. Yeah, it did feel like at the start of the season, everyone was saying, well, Vegas did this. Their first year, they made the cup final. They've made the playoffs every year. That's what she, Seattle should be. You're right. It, it felt unrealistic. I remember the first game that they played uh, was on the road at Vegas. Mm -hmm. It was on ESPN, and Brian Boucher was asked by John Butchgross, what can this Kraken team do? And Brian Boucher said they can make the playoffs. Mm -hmm. uh, because of the division they were in, everyone – felt mm -hmm. that the division was open just felt like a lot of unneeded pressure on a team that yep. just that that should have just never been expectations at least in my mind well that day of the game there were three players left behind when we left the day before because of covid and they had to retest and test and test to get the clearance to play so three frontline players um Jared McCann, Jonas Donskoy, and I believe Jamie Oleksiak had a fly in on three separate private planes to play the game. So even on the first day of the season, there was this unsettledness around, you know, Francis didn't even know if he could ice a lineup and had talked to the league about not playing that game. And the league said, By all, this game is being played. <laughs> this is the launch for ESPN. This game is being played. It's in Vegas. This is happening. So they did get those players in. They almost won that game. Mm -hmm. They're very close to winning that game. They won the next game in Nashville. It was a five-game road trip. They went to Columbus. It went to overtime. They lost. They should have won that game. Mm -hmm. And then they, you know, if they had won the first three, I don't know. I don't, I'm not saying they would have made the playoffs. I'm saying that they came back with one win and mm -hmm. four losses. And then they came home and they should have won the opener and lost late to Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Then kind of won and had a decent homestand, but then November was a mess. And so because of that, they, they, they lost their focus as a team. They, they panicked a little bit and they didn't play sound defensive grinding hockey, which I thought that's all they would do. And then in the division, Vegas was supposed to be great. Everybody else was supposed to be so, so no one saw Calgary being great. No one saw Edmonton playing to the level they did, even with those two great players mm -hmm. and the LA Kings Nobody expected that. And then the two other California teams kind of hung around in the front half of the year. They're better than expected. And here are the old Kraken trying to tread water. So that was that's basically what went on. And then by the time they recaptured any identity as a team, it was too late. It was in the second half of the season, and it, it was just too late. But if you look at Vegas, they're on their third coach, and they've changed the team dramatically to try and be – you know, so relevant to win the cup. I think they have three years to do it with a new coach. And if they don't, their cupboard is pretty bare and uh, they mortgage a lot of their future. So there's two ways to look at this. And right now Vegas looks like a great story because they're a legitimate contender and the Kraken are not, but we'll see as time marches on. Yep. You got a couple minutes left. I want to get back to uh, broadcasting hockey. Obviously you've done it on TV for years uh, you've done a lot of radio too, and uh, yeah. Sports USA uh, in the playoffs. You did the Stadium Series game this year uh, between Tampa and Nashville. I actually, listened to that on the road. That was a lot of fun. Um, and you did the Rangers Lightning Series Eastern Conference yeah. Final. Uh, I I've heard a lot of people say when you're doing hockey on TV, you almost have to deliver something close to a radio call. Yeah, because there's so much going on. The puck is so difficult to follow. So is there differences, uh, radio to TV and hockey? Uh, um, yes, but not a lot. So mm -hmm. I believe I have a radio call on television, but it's done in concert with good television. Um, you know, not as much description, but I do think I'm, I'm player on player all the time. 
And I think that's important. I don't like talking about other things over the play. Um, sometimes you have to, but I think that's not what people want. I know over the years talking to fans, they really want player identification and the excitement of the game. Then they want the why from the analyst, right? So that's what you're looking at. Um, with radio, which I love in my, you know, that's my background. I did seven years of it in the American League before I got to the NHL. Um, I had to rediscover my radio call, like a deep radio call. So what I was very proud of what I was able to do this spring, because I really, at, at first I didn't have it the way I'd like it. And I had to listen to some old radio broadcast from Dan Kelly, who was my guy when I was a kid. And I went back and listened on YouTube to some of that stuff. It helped me a little bit. And what I'm talking about here is resets, time, score, these things you don't have to give ad nauseum on television because somebody's going to say, shut up. I can see it on the screen, yeah. right? So you, those are the things instinctively you have to remind yourself to do that you don't have to do if you do a lot of television, you forget to do that. And of course, the obvious descriptions about where the puck is. And hockey's hard because if you lose any of that, it sounds like a scramble on the radio. And you, you end up not knowing what's happening and that can frustrate it. And I've even listened to some of my stuff back. And I had those moments too, where I'm like, John, you're not very good here. Cause I have no idea where the puck is. So anyway, you really have to do good radio, you know, not radio. That's basically a TV broadcast on radio. There is some of that out there. And then a lot of screaming and yelling when teams score and partisan uh, cheerleading and all of that. But you see that in football, basketball, you see that everywhere today in radio. Um, I think you got to have excitement. I'm not a big fan of that over the top nature. Yeah. Uh, last thing that I'll leave you with here. Uh, when the Kraken had a road trip to uh, Carolina this year, got to come back to PNC arena. Now you had come back to Raleigh to do some NBC stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but, but what was that like? They honored you there uh, when you came back with the Kraken I, I can tell you from the bottom of my heart, we miss you here. We miss you so much here. What was that like coming back and getting that ovation? That was a highlight of my career. It reinforced how great the people, the fans are here, which I always knew. That was the energy that drove me to do whatever I did. Um, when, I, when I left the team in 2020, I wasn't sure that uh, the way that all went down, that it was worth it. I, I, I really felt that way, to be honest with you. But that dissipated over time. When I got to Seattle, I reconnected with a fan base. I understood, wow, this is this is the energy again. I'm, I'm involved in it. Uh, so when I came back on March the 6th, um, I didn't know how this was going to go either because I had never done a game as an opponent's broadcaster in that building. Yeah. I'd done a lot of national games there, as you know, and I did them in the bubble in 2020. And that was different mm -hmm. because I just left the team. And then the last time I saw these guys was on the tarmac when uh, on March 12th or whatever it was, when the league paused and I said goodbye to everybody, not knowing that I would never see them again. Yeah. And uh, so in the bubble in 20, it was it was difficult. Uh, 21 was through the studios in Stanford for NBC. Everything was remote because of COVID. That was weird, but I wasn't in the building. And now this. So now I'm coming in. I'm in the visitor's booth. I've never worked in the visitor's booth. I've never come in and worked with the second crew, the second TV crew. Um, I've never come in with the mindset of beating the Hurricanes and doing a game where you hope you beat them. Yeah. Like I've done the national games where my goal is to give the, the story of the game 50-50, but not come in and do a Kraken broadcast against them. So it was weird, but when they did that, and I'm appreciative that they did, and then the ovation the fans gave me, that was one of the highlights of my, my career because that makes it all worth it. So when I walked out of the building that night um, and went to Toronto, I wish I could have stayed because I didn't have much time with my family at all. Um, but I did feel like I can move forward now. I felt like that was the closure. Um, and it was great that I had that response from the people, but also I knew that I had a mission to do now with the crack. And I felt more like a, a Seattle guy after I did that game. Yeah. Well, we love you here. We still do. And yeah. we, I thank you for joining me. That's hockey, baby. That's John yeah. Forsen, baby. Thanks for joining us. All right, Matthew. Thanks so much. You be good. Take care. It's a pleasure. Thanks. You too. John Forslin on the Behind the Mic podcast. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode of the Behind the Mic podcast with John Forsland. Again, uh, an incredible amount of thanks to 
John Forsland for joining us. One of the best voices, if not the best voices in the game of hockey presently. Can't wait to hear him back on cracking games this upcoming season and hopefully more national worth. The more John Forsland I can get, I'll be uh, very, very happy. I'm sure a lot of people fall in that boat as well. Uh, you heard John mention in the conversation, you've really got to stay in touch in the hockey world, basically 12 months a year, 365 days, because it never stops anymore. Can't wait for the hockey season to get started. Of course, the schedule was released on Wednesday. Uh, there's a lot of tremendous games, as always, opening night, including rematch of the Eastern Conference Final with the Rangers and the Lightning, uh, the Kings and the Golden Knights, the second game uh, on that opening night. I smile because, of course, Colorado won the Stanley Cup, and normally you get the reigning Stanley Cup champions on opening night, but Ball Arena has a concert on opening night, so they will raise their banner on the second night of the season. On that Wednesday, they'll raise their championship banner as the Chicago Blackhawks come into town. Of course, uh, John and the Kraken, they get going. In fact, I think the Hurricanes go to Seattle pretty early in the season. John Forsland and the Kraken will be back in Raleigh for a game against the Hurricanes on a Thursday night, December the 15th. And uh, a lot of great things to come this hockey season. Obviously, the second year of the new uh, rights deal with ESPN and Turner. Can't wait to see how both of that, uh, both of those networks will just continue to grow and get better. Obviously, this is the season where uh, Turner and TNT get the Stanley Cup final. So Kenny Albert, Eddie Olchek in the game, they'll have the Stanley Cup final this year, which will be fun to see and certainly fun to see on the ESPN side. Obviously, Sean McDonough is great. Bob Wischusen, as I said earlier, boy, was he fantastic uh, in his first season calling hockey for ESPN. I think everyone knew he would be good because Bob Wischusen is just that good at everything he does. I don't know if we knew how great he would be, legitimately great at hockey had some amazing moments behind the mic on the hockey season. Specifically, you think uh, he did a game, a couple of games even, in the Penguins and the Rangers series in the first round, did multiple games from the Battle of Alberta with Calgary and Edmonton. He was great, and I can't wait to hear him back on the mic for hockey uh, this coming up season. A lot of storylines to follow through the hockey season, both on the ice and on the media side, which we'll be paying attention to, of course, uh, as we go on. But hope you enjoyed the second episode of the Behind the Mic podcast. Again, big thanks to John Forsland for joining us. Again, if you haven't seen the first episode with ESPN's Tom Hart, do check it out here on the channel. And uh, please do hit the subscribe button get alerts on upcoming videos and when those videos become available. So press the like button, press the subscribe button, and hope you enjoyed this episode of the Behind the Mic podcast. We'll be back with a brand new episode next Friday. Until then, go on. <laughs>